I'll introduce Phil Honey as our next speaker. <laughs> Phil's going to have a little bit of a talk about incorporating technologies on farm and uh, the costs associated with implementation and return on investment in some cases there. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for a really riveting um, presentation, Annie. I, um, I first met Enoch about 18 years ago. We worked out last night, and I think I can honestly say I've learned more in the last 40 minutes than I have in the last 18 years, including uni. So really, thank you for that. Um, and also a big thank you to Georgia and uh, MLA for hosting such an informative event today. I'm Philip, and I work for Stones Coast Farmers down in Albany, and um, works as a smart farms coordinator and yeah just want to know what sort of percentage of this room is actually producer based if you could stick your hand up and are any of you implementing any egg tech at the moment basic yeah so I'm sure we can all pretty well assume that at some stage in our life we've been asked by a family member or possibly a friend how to do something on a computer and it may mean something maybe really quite simple, um, but yeah, it, it never is as easy as that. And it, at the end of the day, that comes down to the way that people learn. So like IT, um, ag tech implementation can be stressful for many. And there are a wide range of questions that producers have, you know, ranging from how do I choose a product? Is the product that I, I'm looking at just a, a real great advertising? Um, or is it actually a quality product? Is it actually fit for purpose? And um, has anyone actually tried this yet? Or is there actually any local support um, to, to utilize products that actually um, are going to get me a, a return on investment at the end of the day? So my role is, um, you know, how do we de-risk this to, to producers? So as part of the Smart Farms Initiative, um, which is a wide range of um, projects that Stones Coast have had over the last couple of years, we've actually tested roughly uh, 75 odd devices and those devices come from a wide range of manufacturers and also a wide range of uh, connectivity types because depending where you are in Australia you might have access to some forms of connectivity or you might be out, actually out in the pastoral areas and you, your only option is really satellite. And one of the most common questions asked is, how do I get started? And it really comes down to four points. It's designing, having a good design of what you're actually trying to do and what problem you are trying to solve. It's never the other way around. You don't find a sensor and then try and identify what problem you can use, or what problem it will solve. Um, what sensors can I use and what are their limitations? Is it actually going to get me the information I need? How is that going to connect? And how am I actually going to make a meaningful decision at the end of the day? Um, thankfully, a lot of this information after um, Enix blasted us with lots of text and numbers and everything's going to be online. So if, you ha if I skip over things quickly, do feel free to look at the slides online. Um, but yeah, look, what problems are you trying to solve? Might be as simple as how do I minimise running out of water? How do I find out if I've got a burst water pipe if I'm actually spending the weekend in Perth? Um, what ways can I actually improve my workforce efficiencies by uh, giving them something better to do then instead of driving down a whole farm looking at three tanks? You also need to look at where you want to go in the future and um, also need to really recognise the fact that not all problems can be solved by technology. Um, and the other aspect there is, is when you start looking at connectivity, there is a solution available for everyone. So uh, 3G, 4G, your, your mobile-based solutions, whether it's a weather station or a tank level sensor, um, they're really quite great, but there's a lot of new technologies coming out. So NBIT and CAT M1 utilize mobile phone networks, um, and you can actually get up to areas, um, get these sensors working. Um, here's one. That's actually a, a, a flow monitor we just hook up. It's got a 10-year battery life, and it can work up to 120 k's away from a Telstra tower. So it, it's amazing what you can do with this sort of stuff. And the other beauty is, is that when you listen to everyone and they say 5G doesn't work, this is actually a 5G technology that nearly every farmer, um, if you're in a grain-producing area, will actually be able to access. 
The other option there is satellite. Um, it's getting a lot cheaper, so we've got access to um, satellite-based tank level monitors and rain gauges. And the beauty is, is that you can actually stick them anywhere. So um, Australia-wide coverage, worldwide coverage. Um, and then if you haven't got um, any of those, you can also look at radio solutions. So this is just an indoor version, but if we took an aerial off and put it in our shed and put a big aerial on the roof, that can create a network that many sensors can actually uh, connect up to, and the price is as low as $400. So there's a wide range of options available, um, and they've all got their positives and negatives. Looking at the important side of things, such as data management, um, depending on which sensor you have, um, a lot of them still have some form of uh, limitation. Some of them have web-based apps, which means that, you know, if you're looking at it on a mobile phone, you actually need to have really, really good phone signal. Um, some send text message alerts, which are really critical if you're looking at water infrastructure in particular. Um, and the other aspect there is, is probably choosing the best provider that has a wide range of um, products available. So um, it's important to note none of these, there's, there's a wide range of produce, uh, sorry, wide range of manufacturers around. Um, and this speech is not necessarily saying that any of these are better than the others. You've got to go through and look at them as a disclaimer. But, you know, something like an LNX sensor here, um, start as low as $500 and the options are endless. You can run it um, for a rain gauge, you can run soil moisture probes off them, flow sensors, pressure sensors, um, and tank level sensors. So the beauty about having one system that connects um, and has lots of different options is, is that you're not going to have 30 different apps to look at on your mobile phone. It's all in one spot. The other challenge is, is that there is a little bit of rubbish out there. Um, so the image on the left there, that's actually a gate contact sensor. Um, it's got this lovely big aerial that helps give signal, but it's that big that it doesn't actually seal. So as soon as it rains, the water runs down that aerial and goes into the box and fries it. So really make sure that you are actually fitting good quality equipment, um, particularly if the support's not locally based. Uh, the images on the right, um, the bottom two there are flow sensors. Um, that point there is actually a cable connection. Um, it's meant to be buried underground. Where that cable is joined, it's just going to leak and it's going to corrode and then you won't get great readings. And then alternatively, um, so is the joiner there. So some of these companies are using, uh, sorry, using $35, $40 sort of sensors and um, if they're not really fitted well, then that's really stopping adoption. And yeah, the other aspect there is is how do I protect it? Um, at the end of the day, we've uh, we've just been awarded an Agri Futures grant project, which is looking at installing rain gauges across the Great Southern. Um, it's a six hundred and fifty dollar rain gauge on the right, and a twenty five dollar rain gauge on the left. And no matter how far or how close you put it to a fence, these things will always get hit. Um, and for yeah, privacy reasons, I've actually hit in the farmer's face, but his penalty for doing so is being put on a slide today. And yeah, luckily it was a $25 side and not the expensive side. Um, many, of the, many of the technologies we've implemented um, throughout the Smart Farms initiative are probably more suited for cropping operations or mixed operations. Um, but being at a livestock event, it's really important to look at the use cases and reflect it back to um, a return on investment in a livestock set at essence. Um, the challenge with a lot of these technologies is that the return on investment isn't easily calculable. Um, for some it's easy and some of it's more difficult. So things like soil moisture probes or even weather forecasting um, having that better understanding of what your conditions are, are like throughout the season, how can you necessarily work back, you know, if I add extra fertiliser or if I put a summer crop on, um, can I easily work out what that benefit would have been if I didn't do it? Um, some of the technologies that we've tested include farm security, um, which is that top sec uh, second from top left, 
um, looking at basically preventing stock loss um, and, and monitoring who's coming in and coming out. Um, these cameras, you know, they're, they're $300, um, connect to the internet, and thankfully for as low as 5 to $12 a month, you can actually get license plate recognition so you can get flagged whether a car that isn't permitted actually rocks up on farm. Um, we're also using soil moisture probes to, um, to help determine whether we do extra fertiliser or summer crop. Remote rain gauges, looking at rainfall variation across the light, uh, landscape and bringing that back to water use efficiency. And um, the four pictures on the right um, is the tank level monitoring, which is, to be completely honest, if you've got one message that I'm going to give you today, it's the easiest and quickest tool you can implement um, and best return on investment straight from start. Um, so the Smart Farms Initiative works over three main demonstration farms that we've got. And um, I thought I'd bring it back to one example. So on this one farm located at Mount Barker, we've installed three tank level monitoring systems. Um, two of these were the LNX branded, which is that one, and one, and the third one was a farm bot system. And they both got their strengths and they both got their weaknesses, and they've also got varying price points. So $640 um, and $88 a year to keep it running compared to $1,120 and $340 a year to keep it running. So, you know, near on 30 cents a day compared to nearly a dollar a day is quite significant. Um, and then, you know, some of them have extra options whether you want to put on rain gauges and everything else. So we looked at it, worked out the distance from the main operations at the house there, how far it takes to look at each of those three tanks, and it's roughly a 35k round trip, and it's one hour to complete by the time you go through and open shut gates and go through the bush tracks. So if we did it every five days, has anyone got to guess how, how long it would take to pay off that unit, those three? Roughly 292 days. So it, it's a no-brainer for this operation. Um, and that works back to, you know, 35 k's at 72 cents per kilometre, which is the ATO tax rate. $25 as a casual labour for one hour, you may be paying more, um, and that number is probably still unrealistic because it doesn't factor in superannuation and everything else. Um, so, you know, after that first year, you're actually netting $615. Over five years, that value there is 13000 so it is quite significant. But, you know, $642 with a little pendant on it, you drill a hole, if you're not convinced, one unit, 7K round trip, checking every five days and taking 12 minutes, it's paid off in the first year. So it's, it's really easy and it's low risk. This is the greatest starting point that you can have. And it's also important to note that sometimes those savings aren't actually come back to a dollar value. It could be something as simple as reducing the risk of um, animal welfare issues in the summer months having better animal insights um, and peace of mind, and also looking at things, you know, potentially mitigating water supply issues, particularly if you've got feedlot operations, and the ability to do other important things and redirecting your workforce to do so. The other one is a pretty cool technology, um, is OptiWay. One of the demonstration sites that I'll talk about in a moment um, is utilising this system. Um, has anyone come across OptiWay in real life? Yeah, pretty cool technology. So um, it's objective weight measurement in the field without that human interaction. So um, biggest selling point really at the end of the day is, is that minimises OHS risks and minimises the time spent moving cattle between yards um, and basically they can eat all day. So inside there is a little attractant. Um, the cow basically sticks its head, head in there, puts the two front hooves on the pad and it's weighed, and it records the animal EID tag. Um, that attractant could be a salt lick, it could be molasses in summer, um, could be any of those sorts of things. And it's relatively low cost. It is currently only available for cattle, but there is a bit of work being done for sheep. So if you were lucky enough to attend the Warwick Many Peaks uh, field walk, in May earlier this year, one of the um, PDS hosts, Kent Rochester, um, has, his site was visited. 
And uh, Ken is one of the producers that was involved in an MLA PDS that we currently have operating at Stones Coast Farmers. And what we're, idea what we're looking at is um, alternative summer forage crops, things such as Palatin Raffno, Millet, uh, Highland 970 Canola, Cowpea and Sorghum. And what we want to do is we want to take advantage of summer rainfall and help determine what species are best suited for our region. Um, so in last year we had um, Raffno and pill uh, Millet planted and Kent chucked in 250 steers in late October. Um, and that, those steers had a 325 kilo average weight and ad-lib hay was available. After 10 days, the visible um, condition looked poorer. And um, the other side of it was is that Kent was watching it on his um, OptiWay system and was saying that they had pretty well negligible um, average daily gains. So he put it through, um, grabbed all the the steers through, brought, put them in the yards, and they actually found that the average daily gain was 0 0.08 kilograms. It was nothing. Um, on the raffno, compared to the two kilos per day he was having previously on ryegrass and clover. So it is, you know, getting that information in the paddock is um, a real, real positive thing. So Kent had a bit of a chat with the agronomist, the nag supply agent, and also the local vet. Um, and it came back to that the cattle were ill-adjusted to the um, to graze the raffno, and there was a lot of work um, and advice provided. So, you know, on introduction practices to maximise their potential weight gains. Uh, a little bit later on, 120 kilos were added onto the um, sorry, 120 heifers were added in onto the raffno, um, and they was taken on and off, looking um, between the raffno and the pasture, and those um, heifers gained a one kilo average daily gain um, before the raffino was cooked from the heat and diamondback moss and everything else. So it's a real interesting plant, raffino. Um, it is a cross between kale and radish. Um, it has a real, it has, it is a good quality feed, but the biggest um, benefit, well, you've just got to be careful on how you induct your animals into it, to be honest. So tools such as the OptiWay um, help help monitor average daily gains in livestock and can help identify any uh, potential shortcomings or issues with feed intake. Um, if you were to look at back at a dollar's value, you know, those 250 steers at the start, if they were still continuing to get two kilos average daily gains, 10 days, $4 a kilo, that's 20 grand. So, you know, that, that could have paid off that, that OptiWay relatively easily. The beauty about the, um, the OptiWay system is, is that it, it, it helps um, producers basically monitor livestock throughout the day, uh, sorry, throughout days without having that, you know, without having to take them off the feed. So you can also factor in if you're spending a day putting them into the yards and taking them back and they're not eating and they're losing $2, uh, sorry, two kilos, that's $8 per cow a day as well. So you can really use, you can, if you monitor your ADG, then at least you can work out whether you need to um, look at, all, you know, extra feeding or, or, or moving them so you can ensure that they have sufficient gains. Um, and you can also class your animals as well, which is really quite good. So cows and calves with a lower weight gain um, could be moved onto pasture and um, highest, and trade cattle could be chucked onto um, higher weight gain paddocks. We're really excited um, that we've just, as ironic as it might sound, been awarded future drought funding in Albany, um, and we are doing pasture prediction. Um, so um, within the next six months, we'll be developing a dashboard and bringing um, the farming forecaster type concept, which has been really well received over east with NARA farming systems, um, to WA and to the Great Southern. So the group is uh, spending a fair bit of time over the next couple of months installing additional weather stations um, and implementing that into um, better forecasting. And really at the end of the day, um, what we want to do is we want to be able to provide growers in the Great Southern objective data which they can implement for on-farm management decision, uh, decisions. So um, you probably don't need to use it this year to tell you whether you need to look at implementing a summer crop, but if you're on a questionable year, um, you can certainly use it.
And so it is using the uh, CSIRO Pastures API, which is really quite cool. Um, it utilizes 30 years worth of pasture prediction, puts it into quartiles, and um, you can actually see where you are tracking compared to um, historic values. And what we want to be able to do is, is make, you know, make capture decisions. Um, maybe we've got enough pasture that we might want to bring on extra livestock, or we might want to sell them at a later date and know that we've got enough feed to do so. So the take-home message is, um, is your time and travel is valuable. Um, Enoch mentioned it before. Um, family farms are really terrible for it. So, you know, something as low cost as $600 odd dollars um, can save everyone money. It's the most easiest thing to do. And there is obviously non-dollar benefits from implementing technology, whether it's improved animal welfare outcomes um, and increased workforce efficiency gains. Always start simple with the basics and work your way up. Um, water level monitoring equipment is easy to use and it will pay itself off most times within 12 months of implementation. And there are ways to connect sensors wherever you are in Australia. Uh, always identify the problem before choosing the sensor and always remember that technology can objectively alert you to issues before it's too late whilst giving you helpful peace of mind. If you are interested in um, some of the stuff that we've been testing, we do have a range of materials available um, to members and non-members. It is free, open or all. And um, yeah, it's all available through the SCF website under the project section. And over the next three years, we'll be updating those MLA PDS results. Um, really quite excited about that. There's also DeepHerd, um, who helped fund the original Smart Farms trials, have a really great resource link available there, that bit.ly address. Um, Warwick recorded all of the Many Peaks forum, which is really quite handy. Um, and session five was Kent's one, where he goes into detail about the OptiWay and walkover weighing equipment that he's done. Um, and I think Tim probably can explain. I think there was seven or eight sessions, roughly. Yeah, and they're all available on YouTube. And MLA is looking at a lot of his smart farms uh, technology as well. So Romani Pastoral Company and Kabula are the two original smart farms over east. And we can't, you know, can't say that we would be here today without the support from um, Deep Herd, National Land Care Programs, Future Drought Funds, AgriFutures, and of course MLA for their PDS support. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, smart tags. Do you want to open the can of worms? Any comments? Watch this space, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm not too familiar with them, to be honest, Phil. Um, at, just before I hopped on, we had a smart tag trial um, with iTag, I think it was from memory. It was approximately two years ago. Um, I think it's really important if you are looking at smart tags. Um, to make sure that you've got the right sensors and everything to help the network in particular. We had a lot of issues with LoRaWAN. Um, if you are interested in, in, in implementing it, make sure you've got local support. That was the biggest challenge. If you haven't got someone that's able to come over and help you, um, watch that spot. Was, uh, yeah. I know the Belinda Lay down in Esperance has been using... Um, yeah, Digit Animal, yeah. Um, and Deeper Katanning have only just started a trial as well. That utilizes a Sigfox network, which is really quite interesting because it's a supposedly publicly available network that you don't have to manage, you just pay a device fee. Um, and that's yielding quite good results too. Any other questions for Phil? I did have one, Phil. Um, I just wondered about the drought resilience yeah. uh, project that you were talking about. When, yeah. like I know that's being developed at the moment, when do you expect that that's something producers can start to utilise? Yeah, approximately six months' time. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it comes back to um, support. 
and I think so. I've I've invested in um, some Laura Wan, and um, I think one of the challenges is support, and also because they are small startup companies, they're often extremely small, and they come and go like that. Yeah, and so I don't know whether you've got any advice, <laughs> sage advice for those of us that are, yeah. uh, that go in early and then maybe. The supply evaporates. It's, it's a real challenge. Um, like all great things, you really want to work with a company that's established. Um, my biggest tip is if you are dabbling in it, look at alternative technologies like NBIT, which utilise like a Telstra network on steroids. Um, at the end of the day, Phil, you know you can buy a gateway and they're nice and cheap. It's five hundred bucks. You spend another five hundred bucks on cabling. Now, the problem that you have when you go with a solution like this is when something doesn't work, where isn't it working? Is it the gateway? Is it the Telstra modem? Is it the server in the cloud that this gateway talks to? Or is it the device? Something like a cellular-based solution, there's only really two things that can go wrong. You either haven't got the Telstra coverage or it's the device itself. And if it's the device itself, you've got one manufacturer that you're dealing with. There's no finger pointing. It either works or it doesn't. And so my suggestion is, is that the NBIT and CAT M1s and even the satellite solutions are great because the end of the day, if this costs you $1,500, you know, in installation, cabling, antennas, <coughs> gateways, internet connections, everything else, I can buy a lot of these on $88 a year before I have, I've covered the cost of that. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah's tag, yeah. Yeah. No. Spot on. Yeah. It's a chicken egg scenario. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is a bit of a chicken egg scenario because to you know to get scale and like well, how do you you know how do you how do you start out? Do you charge a lot and only sell a few, or do you charge less and sell a lot? Um, the cattle tags and that are an interesting one because they aren't very very rarely put on any or on every animal. They are you know you might put a subset off, whether it's five percent or, or so on. Where the real value in it is probably not on the animal itself, it's actually the, the behaviour and where they are eating, where are they sleeping and so on. And then going back and working out why they are in those areas. Is it a pasture type or a grass that they're looking at? How do I modify that and then bump up that production? So, Jim? The OptiWeed, does that um, read the hills tag? Uh, yes. Yeah. Is there any thoughts to Two regions together at a watering point? Uh, yeah, so I probably didn't actually explain it very well, um, Jim. But it's actually a trailed unit. Um, it's got a little tow bar and it just basically flips down. And most people are actually tying with a, like a four drive quad bike. So it is really easy to move it between. Um, yeah, it, it is really easy to move it between um, paddocks and, and you can move it, yeah. No issues at all. Yeah. Um, Phil, I was just wondering. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, for the water tank monitoring. Yep. How long do you think they would like? Do you expect them to last out in the weather, and what the replacement cost would be for those? Yeah. So, it comes down at the end of the day probably to how many times it updates. 
Um, now, LNX and majority of the other manufacturers that I've talked to, they're suggesting 10, 10, up to 10 years, um, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, but that's, to be realistic, probably one to two ratings a day, which is not enough. The beauty about this one here is, is it's just one little battery there, and that's $35. So if, if you do bump up that reporting, it's absolutely nothing. Um, we've had equipment in for a year now, and battery levels within the apps haven't dropped, um, and they're updating nearly hourly. This was just a quick one that was, um, how can you ensure the uh, all the mob go through the um, OptiFeed, uh, OptiWay, rather than just the pushy ones? <laughs> That's the trick at the moment, yeah. So there will be a bit of favouritism and there will be the, the livestock that will love to uh, spend a bit more time on the lick. Um, how do you better, yeah, how do you get that? No, not at the moment, no. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. And their accuracy is within about ten kilos. Yeah. I think it's probably, um, it's just that extra bit of data too at the end of the day. And, you know, you, you would still be collecting some of that live weight, whether it was walk-on way or whether they're in the yards. So it's you, you should still theoretically be able to track those trends. Yeah, so a couple of the dashboards that we use, because we've got so many technologies available, we've actually got uptime monitoring. And so we do get a notification. We can actually see the duration that products aren't working as well. So it has got that reliability. Um, the good companies will make it robust and they'll supply robust equipment. Um, it's when you start getting it, the average sort of quality stuff um, like the cheap cabling down the bottom there, you know, it's security cable, it's not even waterproof. You've got to protect that at all costs. Um, so it, it does come back down to choosing a provider that's actually got good quality equipment and it is rugged. Um, and the guys that are selling to the pastoral areas have it down pat. Uh, manufacturer specific. Yeah. 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 No, it is manufacturer specific. All right. If there's no more questions for Phil, we've still got Alan and Enoch here in the room. If there are any follow up questions that anyone's thought of, now's the chance before we break for afternoon tea. Yeah. Uh, you got if you got really good like if you're a really good uh, producing high quality feed and if that's your value for instance the quarter mains we were talking about earlier they, they have a feedlot they've got a good feedlot and um, so I was saying to them, if they could maximize their production of bodies at a lower weight, they have the ability to value add those lightweight bodies. So for them, it made sense to try to calb late and wean early. Uh, but primarily, I'm trying to protect the mother. It's kind of like the classic scenario with almost all the stuff I talked about in Esperance when I'd be talking to people. People would say the same thing, and then I would respond the exact same way, which you'll get in a moment. And I'd be like, for instance, people that didn't preg test. And I'd say, why don't you preg test? Oh, look, I'll find out later. I say, well, you know, we can find out early and get those girls gone that are just dull bludgers and put them on a truck. You know, away they go. And then you'll save feed. Oh, but if I save feed, the rest of my cows will get fat. Okie dokie. I say, well, you could wean early. 
uh, so that, you know, there's less pressure on the cows. Oh, but then my cows will get fat. Um, you could calve in winter. My cows will get fat. Um, because I'm lower stocking density. So what's the answer to all those solutions? Let's run more cows. <laughs> I mean, that's our job, isn't it? Kilograms of beef per hectare to go back to what Pegsy was saying. So <clears throat> I guess my goal of weaning early is to try to run more cows. And myself, I've got stubbles and seconds, and I confinement feed, or we confinement feed, and we, we send our lightweight weaner. The heavies go to a feedlot. The lights go to for confinement feeding, and we try to value at our stubbles and the, and the seconds that we can acquire is what we do. Uh, no, two, 200 kilos would be my cutoff, depending on what's happening in the season. Like if I've got bonds or feed, I'm not going to go in there and take them off their mothers. It, you got to look, I think my advice to folks is to look ahead at your feet, you know, the, the feed and feed in front, you know, do your feed forecasting. And if I'm in trouble and I'm looking at the cows and they're starting to slip in body condition and the seasons looks like we're going to have an early finish to the season, then I'm more likely to bring them in. So we better get the wieners off them. And then we'll use a 200 kilogram cutoff. But if it's a ripper season like this year in Esperance, it's nuts. It's just insane. I'm going to leave those calves on longer than normal. So, but I'm, but I'm happy to go down to 200 kilos is what I'm saying. Yeah. <clears throat> no, no. It was, I remember talking to a farmer because I, I ask a lot of questions. I obviously also talk a lot. But when I first got to Esperance and I, I was talking to this one fellow and I said, so, when do you wean? He said, uh, January sale. I said, what do you do if it's a really good season? January sale. So what do you do if it's a really bad season? January sale. I'm like, man, flexibility drives profitability. Information drives flexibility. So um, capture information, use honey's gear, use whatever gear you can on, on offer. The, the in paddock weighing stuff to me is just got so many options there and opportunities, isn't there? But yeah, be flexible is the main thing. I guess would be my advice. But you can wean them that early, and it's not going to hurt them. Like we learned a lot out of the severe drought up in Queensland. They're weaning some of those in America. There in Oklahoma, in the big drought we had in the in the mid two thousands, they're weaning down to six weeks in beefies. And these little calves are like freaking seventy, eighty kilos. Um, we got two. Yeah. yeah. Scary on the scourge side of thing. So there are. Yeah, yeah, so wood scours is your is your big worry? Yeah, that's uh, general paddock. Ah, yep. Uh, True. Are you in Nanup? <laughs> yeah, yep, 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 yep. Not copy. There, um, the, uh, so scours outbreaks, I'll, I'll talk on scours real quickly. Scours outbreaks are kind of like a coronavirus outbreak. Coronavirus is one of the scours agents. Rotavirus, coronavirus, crypto, coccidia, salmonella. Um, an animal is susceptible and there's carriers in the population and then when they get stressed, they shed it and the little cap will pick it up and he'll amplify it and then he'll give it two and those two will make it to four and four to eight, 16, blah, blah, blah. And so there's some really cool stuff done in the Sandhills in Nebraska if you can segregate them into groups. And what they're doing in the Sandhills, rotationally grazing, and they went from eight acres to the cow to 11 acres. So from 11 acres to the cow to eight acres to the cow by rotational grazing. But they're having a lot of calving. They're looking at a lot of scours trouble because of the density in the paddocks. And so they worked out what they started doing was everything when they were, they're rotating, rotationally grazing as they were calving, they would open a gate and they would allow everything through that hadn't calved. And so they would go forward and everything that had calved would stay. And then that group would be then be moved forward and they, and they would concertina them. So if they're moving them every week, you know, there's this group. Then there's this group, and there's this group. And then after about four or five weeks old, they box them back together again from the back end. And it fixed most of the scours issues. So if you integrate fixed time AI, it's pretty easy to go first round, second round, third round. You could break them into groups. Because one of my advice for producers say, oh, I'm having a hell of a scours outbreak. I say, well, let's just stop urge, and re reset everything. Take everything that hasn't calved if you can, no utter. <laughs> Start them again. Let everything that has calved stay there. Because it's always the, last, the later calves that break the scours. But yeah, I'm hearing what you're saying. Um, it depends on what they're going to get challenged with. So, the, you know, the Rhoda, Corona, um, and E. coli generally. There's two different varieties. Um, for my Wagyu producers, I advise they use them because Wagyu's have really poor colostrum. Um, I guess I advocate it, but I don't advocate it for a lot of my producers. I try to manage it with management myself. I don't really push pink eye vaccines either, unless you're selling bulls, because a bull with a bad eye is going to be a hard bull to sell, probably get a return on investment, but it's pretty sporadic. I think you can manage it. 
oh, you can manage your way out of it. And my advice on scouring calves is if you can catch them, treat them unless they're dead and then leave them alone. And to treat them is just um, vitrate, sugar and salt. So the intestinal lining of the gut, uh, sugar is highly sought after. It's a huge molecule and it goes through a sodium glucose co-transporter. And so it really wants the sugar, but it's got to take salt with it. And it's sugar is 16 times bigger than a sodium molecule. So 16 parts sugar, one part salt, which is easy to remember, sweet 16. Remember 16 year old girls, 16 year old boys, how sweet they were. Then we grow up and they're mean and nasty. Sweet 16, 16 scoops of sugar, one scoop of salt, stir it up. If there's crystals in the bottom, put more water in it, and then hide, uh, drench those calves with that if you can't get Vitrate or the other products. Because they want that sugar. They take the sugar, take it to the brain, the salt stays, and it's like salt on a wine stain. It'll pull water across the gut lining, rehydrate them, get them up. In dairies, yep. In It would, that's why you see more scours in young stock heifers, first calvers, because they don't have their own immunity. Colostrum is the accumulation of the mother's immunity. Management-wise, move them along, like I was saying, bump them along. Not a big fan of vaccination. You're not really going to get a beef heifer to do better with passive transfer. If I have calving intervention, I advocate to my clients that they strip colostrum and feed the calf colostrum if they intervene with a calving heifer. But on the rest of those beefies, we don't have any way to manage passive transfer other than to immunize them prior to calving, which is the idea with scour guard. But actually, in the dairy, on the other hand, we're taking them off mum. So we try to get four liters of milk through those girls because we're... Yeah, right. Where are they getting the colostrum? Powdered colostrum is pretty poor. Most of the powdered colostrum is, um, is um, they, they spray blood from the cows onto a hot drum. Is my understanding is I get it from blood, which because it's just antibodies from blood. Um, but yeah, cure, yeah, interesting. But I reckon if you got if you're having to go to those depths, um, I would be looking at other management ways to fix it. But excellent point, hundred percent. But I don't have any of my clients actively managing passive transfer. But. So you correctly mentioned that uh, <coughs> raw. So any sense of that raw? We, d we did a did a trial at Lawson's, 100% AI, and we had multi-min, multi-min without copper, and cobalt plus sodium plus cobalt, and then control, and statistically we showed an improvement in conception rates to AI. Um, copper is, um, uh, well, let's go to ones that are easier. Selenium is directly important to membrane stability. Um, zinc's important on the bull side of things. Um, Cobalt, uh, reaching mature cow weight and plane of growth. So I think if you're cobalt deficient, copper, I guess, is indirectly linked as well. I guess it's all quite important, but Swiss Ultivite, you know who buys Swiss Ultivite? It's not the young people in the room. It's people like you and me that are losing our hair and starting to get fat. We buy that stuff because we want our youth back and, and we're easy to con. Um, micro minerals are great. See what you got going on. Certainly doesn't hurt to give them. And the evidence seems to be that you can improve conception rates. But, but I mean, many a time have people said to me, what do you think's going on? My, you know, my, my heifers aren't growing out quite well. I say, oh, hmm, for short on vitamin F. And they go, oh, where do I get that road train of hay? Um, you know, it's, <laughs> the basics are important, you know, the main things. But so micro minerals don't solve everything, but, but they are beneficial. But I, I don't reach for them like big time. <clears throat> Blood testing is like the carburetor. So for copper especially, they could be almost on the brink of deficiency, but they've still got copper in their serum. Blood testing works pretty good. If it's severe, you'll pick it up in the blood. Um, liver biopsies are better, but like a lot of us vets are kind of scared to do liver biopsies on live animals. It doesn't hurt them, actually. The work's been done. You can stab them, get some liver biopsies. Morbidity is very low, but a lot of us are still kind of chicken shit about it. Um, but yeah, it's a great place to start. I say to folks, look, you can check the soil, but is it getting into the plant? You can check the plant, but is it getting into the cow? And so things like molybdenum tie up copper, sulfur ties up copper. Um, lo there's lots of interactions at that base level that we don't see. If you're grazing mono species plants, like crop grazing, you can get some real weird stuff happen because if all you ate was steak, and I've done it for a week, we called it a week of meat, me and my roommate when we were in college, and man, I lost like 10, five, I lost six kilos and I wasn't even trying to. I was eating mountains of meat. But man, that, when that week ended, I went to a barbecue and there was a thing full of salad and I just sat there for like an hour. Um, <laughs> and I hate salad. 
So <laughs> I think when they, when you got them on just like a straight vetch paddock, for instance, or, you know, we see some weird hypophosphatemia stuff on, on uh, barley paddocks and things like that where people are doing grazable crops. So, so be aware that monocultures can cause issues. So you probably do want to cover your microminerals. You also probably want to give them access to some hay or something like that to supplement it. Um, yeah, because here's something to just take home that I think is important for me, when I'm, and I'm not a nutritionist, but cows turn cellulose into energy, just like termites turn wood into energy. Cellulose is highly energetic. Um, that's why it burns so easily. But to break it down, the little bugs, they, they break it down just like in a termite, and they break these cellulose, which are very similar to a glucose molecule, C6H606, but they're linked differently. They break it down into these short-chain volatile fatty acids that get absorbed, and that gets turned into ADP into ATP. So they, but to get to that cellulose, you got to have protein. So when we feed a cow protein, it's not about feeding the cow protein; it's about feeding the bugs protein. So the protein, so those bugs can break down the cellulose to produce the energy to keep the cow alive. And then as those bugs die, they absorb that liqueur, which is full of protein, which then benefits them. So we've got to keep that in the back of our mind. We've got to make sure we keep that protein right. So if, if you're grazing something like a vetch or, or a lucerne or something that's like 20% protein, hay is like barley straw is cheap as chips, and they're going to really get some goodie out of it because they got all this lovely protein. Conversely, if you're on wheat stubbles and they're looking big in the guts, but they're starting to get ribby, that's because their rumen's full of a big fiber mat. We need to give them some protein. So if you keep that in the back of your head, it makes the whole feeding job a little bit easier, I think. And then the microminerals fit in there in the story. I'm is that cool? <laughs> Take a breath. In a nutshell. <laughs> uh, thank you all very much for attending this session. A big thanks to all three of our speakers. Um, <laughs>